Thanks for joining us today for this month's Grand Rounds presentation. Um, presenting today will be Ali Al Ramadan, MD, who is a research um, scholar at University of Michigan Flint and Insight Research Institute. Um, he will be presenting on acute and post-acute neurological complications of COVID-19. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comment below and we will get back with you at the end of his presentation. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Ali Ramadan. Uh, I am a research scholar working with the Insight Research Institute uh, and affiliated with the University uh, of Michigan. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Omar Rababa and I, uh, have published a paper recently uh, about the topic of acute and post acute neurological complications of COVID 19 patients. Today, I'm going to uh, give some information uh, about the topic briefly. Uh, so uh, what we'll, we'll talk about today uh, is neurological complications, COVID-19 statistics, pathophysiology of uh, neurological complications, uh, acute neurological complications, post-acute neurological complications, and COVID-19 associated neurological symptoms in pediatrics. Uh, as well as neurological side effects associated with COVID-19 treatments. Uh, we will start with the uh, neurological complications statistics. So uh, the reported uh, neurological complications indicate that they are common. Many studies have reported percentages of neurological complications in COVID-19 patients. Uh, a large retrospective study uh, in the Lancet Psychiatry showed that one third of patients were diagnosed with a neurological complication or psychological condition within six months of contracting the COVID-19. The spectrum of neurological com conditions associated with COVID-19 is very wide, which ranges from my mild non-specific symptoms, such as headache, to very specific and severe neurological disorders, such as encephalitis. So uh, now we'll talk about the pathophysiology and mechanisms of neurological complications. So based on the mode of viral transmission and entry, SARS-CoV-2 mainly targets the respiratory system. It is not clear yet how the virus causes these com com complications. Several mechanisms have been suggested to cause the neurological complications. So these complications could be due to a combination of direct viral cytopathic effects and hyperventilation of host immune response. Now we'll talk more about these mechanisms. <clears throat> so as you see, this image illustrates uh, the mechanisms uh, that causes the neurological complications. As you can see, uh, there are immunological and non-immunological mechanisms. So now we will discuss them further. The first mechanism is the cytokine storm. So uh, what's the cytokine storm? There is no single definition of cytokine storm that's widely accepted. Generally, it is characterized by uncontrolled and excessive release of pro-inflammatory signaling molecules called cytokines, uh, such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNA. So uh, cytokine storm is known to be associated with COVID-19 severity. And the most important one uh, is the interleukin-6 uh, levels, which is highly correlated with the disease mortality. Um, cytokine storm can cause damage to and injury to the blood-brain barrier, which allows the cytokines and blood material to penetrate the brain parenchyma, which, allow, which can result in seizures and encephalopathy. Uh, cytokine storm could contribute to a form of headache that appears on the seventh to tenth day of clinical onset of COVID-19 illness. So uh, this image illustrates how cytokine storm can uh, induces the neurological complications. 
as you see here, uh, initially it causes disruption of blood brain barrier, which allows the immune cells, including the lymphocytes and monocytes, to infiltrate into the uh, CNS. Uh, when they reach the CNS, they will cause injury by neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration, and demyelination. Uh, the second uh, mechanism that's been suggested is the neuroinvasion. Uh, viral neuroinvasion is the ability of the virus to directly attack the central nervous system. Uh, the evidence of SARS-CoV-2 invasion into the cerebral cerebrospinal fluid is very limited, and positive results are rare as well. Uh, in fact, sensory neurons are in close proximity to the mucosa, mucosal epithelial cells which can become infected by the virus, leading to a retrograde transport of the virions through the cribriform plate into the CNS. Um, it has been suggested that positive detection of the virus could be due to blood-brain barrier injury uh, break or breakdown or the presence of uh, inside of viral particles. So, there are some evidence that support the direct viral invasion of the SARS-CoV-2 into the central nervous system. Uh, the first one is the presence of S2 receptors, uh, which are the intracytes of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they are expressed in the brain tissue. Uh, second one is SARS-CoV-2 shares similarities to SARS-CoV-1, uh, which has been shown previously to invade the nervous system based on preclinical studies and uh, post-mortem analysis. Uh, post-mortem analysis of patient with neurological manifestation uh, detected SARS-CoV-2 in the frontal lobe. Uh, meningitis and encephalitis were reported as isol isolated presentations concomitant with SARS-CoV-2 detection in the CSF in certain cases. So, um, um, so many studies uh, went further investigate uh, that were that focused on the CSF uh, were done. A systematic review by Lewis and colleagues found that six percent of patients with COVID-19 who had a CSF analysis had a positive SARS-CoV-2 in their CSF. CSF uh, cell count was increased in 43 percent of fatal cases. Uh, in comparison to 29% of, uh, of non-severe cases. Uh, the most common CSF finding was the elevated CSF proteins, uh, which was more common in fetal COVID-19. So uh, this image illustrates how viral neuroinvasion can cause uh, CNS damage. So after the viral invasion into the central nervous system, uh, it will bind to the receptors found uh, on the CNS, including mainly S2 receptors. Uh, this will lead to immune-mediated CNS damage by activating the immune system, the central nervous system. Uh, so the, th the third mechanism that's been suggested to cause the uh, neurological complications is the molecular mimicry. So uh, molecular mimicry is when a foreign antigen has similar structure to self-antigen and can induce immune response against self-antigen caused by sequence similarity between foreign and self-peptides. Uh, molecular mimicry is involved in many diseases such as multiple sclerosis and gallium barrier syndrome. Autoantibodies have been detected in, number, uh, in a number of patients with COVID-19. Uh, it is believed that these autoantibodies may contribute to severity and complications of COVID-19. Um, the role of autoantibodies in neurological complications was first suggested by the occurrence of gallium barre syndrome in COVID-19 patients. <clears throat> Shared immunologic sequence between SARS-CoV-2 and number of human proteins known as heat shock proteins like HSP90B and HSP60. Autoantibodies against heat shock proteins are involved in many neurological diseases, including gallium barre syndrome, uh, which supports this hypothesis. Uh, autoantibodies uh, were also found against non-neural proteins, 
like the NMDA receptors. Uh, so this, uh, this is a project that we work uh, on with the University of Michigan. Uh, the fourth mechanism is the systemic complication or systemic complications. So patients with severe COVID-19 illness develop many complications that could aggravate or contribute to the observed medical complications. Uh, systemic complications of COVID-19, such as hypoxia, coagulation abnormalities, and electrolytes, uh, ch electrolyte changes. Uh, coagul uh, coagulation abnormalities seen in cases of COVID-19 may precipitate strokes observed in COVID-19 patients. Since the brain is highly sensitive to hypoxia, prolonged COVID-19 mediated hypoxia could cause serious complications. So, uh, so what are the neurological complications? We divided them into non-specific and specific neurological complications. So the incidence of non-specific neurological complications uh, in patients with COVID-19 uh, was confirmed, uh, was confirmed COVID-19 diagnosis has been reported by several studies. These symptoms include headache, 12% uh, patient, alternative status, dizziness, depressed level of consciousness, uh, agnosia, which is loss of taste, anosmia, which is loss of smell, myalgia, uh, which is muscle pain, and fatigue. So, uh, also there were uh, reported acute neurological complications uh, in many uh, case report and clinical studies as well as case series. These include cerebrovascular complications, subarachnoid hemorrhage, encephalopathy, acute hemorrhage, necrotizing encephalopathy, uh, encephalitis, antinemia, encephalitis, meningitis, encephalitis, uh, acute myelitis, demyelinating disorders, and seizures. So COVID-19 associated neurological symptoms in pediatrics. Neurological complications of COVID-19 seem to be higher in children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Neurological manifestations include headache, meningism, and mental status alteration. Interestingly, most patients achieve full recovery with IV immunoglobulins with, or, or, or steroid treatments will support the theory of autoantibodies generation. So, post-acute neurological complications. So post-acute COVID-19 syndrome is a term that has been used recently to describe the complications that extend beyond the, the, beyond the duration of which initial illness and after recovery of SARS-CoV-2 infection. 35% uh, of patients with mild COVID-19 didn't return to baseline after recovery. Uh, fatigue, changes in concentration, loss of memory, sleep disorders, cough, and dyspnea were the main reported symptoms. So as you see here, uh, this image illustrate the timeline of COVID-19 uh, infection. And after the period of four weeks, you can see we have the post-acute COVID-19. So uh, as you can see here, it is uh, a multi-organ uh, syndrome that can cause fatigue, decline quality of life, muscular weakness, joint pain. And the respiratory system can cause dyspnea, cough, persistent oxygen re requirements. In the central nervous system, it can cause anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, cognitive, disper cognitive disturbances, headache. Uh, in the cardiovascular system, it will cause palpitation and chest pain. Uh, in, the, sorry, uh, in the vascular system, it might cause thromboembolism. Uh, renal system, it will cause chronic kidney disease. And in the, in the dermatologist's skin, it can cause hair loss. Um, after the period of 12 weeks, it will be a chronic or post-acute COVID-19, from week four to week 12, it will be subacute or ongoing COVID-19. 
So this image illustrates the management of uh, post-acute COVID-19. Uh, as you can see here, it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, where the patient should be seen the primary care uh, and there will be consideration of early rehabilitation and patient education uh, plus uh, enrollment in clinical research studies with active engagement with patient advocacy groups. Um, regarding the neuropsychiatry, there should be screening for anxiety, depression, PTSD, sleep disturbances, and cognitive disorder. So neurological side effects associated with COVID-19 treatments. Uh, many of those treatments that are being used for COVID-19 have the potential to cause neurological or psychiatric symptoms. An example of these medications is lupinavir and ritonavir and dexamethasone. Uh, lupinavir ritonavir combination treatment was found to be associated with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms are common side effects of corticosteroids. Uh, other side effects that were observed in patients with uh, patients receiving corticosteroids include mem memory deficits and cognitive impairment. Although these are uh, more common in patients receiving long-term cor corticosteroids. So summary for what we have discussed today. Uh, Neurological complications of COVID-19 are common. Uh, there, is no single, no, there is no single mechanism by which SARS-CoV-2 cause neurological complication. Um, it is critical to further investigate and understand the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 and mechanisms. Post-acute COVID-19 is a major issue, uh, could be misdiagnosed for psychiatric illness uh, further studies need to be done to investigate causes and treatment of post-acute COVID-19. So uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our topic. Uh, please, if you have any questions, um, my colleagues and I will be pleased to answer them. Okay, guys, that was great. Um, does anyone have any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I have a question. Do you know if the COVID vaccine would cause depression? Um, so uh, for the uh, COVID-19 vaccine, um, depends like which type uh, you are talking about. Um, obviously many of them will have uh, different side effects. Um, However, the reported side effects uh, were mainly on the concern of thromboembolism. Um, currently, I'm not aware of any studies that have reported uh, any symptoms like of depression or of psychiatric illness. Uh, if there are like, if you are any, uh, aware of any, uh, if you can uh, tell us about them. Um, well, I have a history of bipolar and. I did get the second dose of the vaccine, um, Moderna, on March 10th. And probably at the end of March, I started feeling more depressed for no reason. Um, and it's been kind of like two, three weeks of it. And it, I'm still trying to, to get out of it on my own and with therapy, but um, I haven't changed anything on my medication list or anything like that. So I just was curious to see if anybody else has had more depression or psychiatric problems with the COVID vaccine? Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I see. This is actually a, a very good question uh, about if the vaccine itself can cause similar uh, uh, illness or a spectrum to the uh, disease itself, such as the post-acute COVID-19, as the, the chronic COVID-19 or post-acute COVID-19 mainly uh, causes neuropsychiatric symptoms such as depression and fatigue. Uh, but this is uh, when the patient got the illness. Uh, however, uh, it's early to judge if the vaccine also can cause these complications. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting topic that uh, 
needs to be uh, further investigated if, uh, if it can cause similar uh, complications to the uh, like illness itself. Okay. I have another question, if I may. Um, have you ever heard of the dr drug Vasepa, V-A-S-E-P-A? Drug Vasepa? Vasepa, V as in Victor, A-S-E-P-A. Oh, um, um, that's an anti-inflammatory um, cardiovascular. cardiovascular medication. And I wondered if you used it at all for COVID patients. So um, like, I'm not aware of this medication, uh, if it's being used in uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, a lot of the medication that's been uh, recently in the market, uh, especially the antibodies, have been tested to see if uh, the efficacy of these antibodies. Uh, some of them showed some kind of efficacy while others uh, have not. Um, for uh, this VASIBA, I'm not uh, aware of it, I'm sorry. Okay. I just know it's a really good anti-inflammatory and I know the company Amrin, A-M-R-N, um, mm -hmm. has done some testing and um, research on it and uh, they were seeing that it did help some of the COVID patients. So I just was asking. Yeah, I see. So it's like anti-inflammatory. Uh, it will uh, reduce the infl inflammation mainly, probably the cytokine storm. Uh, mm -hmm. similar probably to the dexamethasone or corticosteroid, which was found to uh, reduce the inflammation significantly and improve the uh, clinical status of the patients. Um, so I'm not sure uh, of the exact mechanism of uh, this medication, but as long as it reduces the inflammatory response, uh, I'm sure it will, like, it will improve the clinical status. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, so are there any further questions for um, Ali Al Ramadan? And the um, if not, we will close this out and call it an end to today's grand rounds presentation. Okay, thank you guys for joining us for today's presentation with Ali Al Ramadan. Um, please make sure to follow us on social media. We are on IG, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And this will be posted on there for those who weren't able to make it today. Thank you again, Ali Al Ramadan. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today.